Canada, I see leadership, for example, and I love that Keurig's here. And I'm thinking, yeah, so fun fact, which you may not know. Um, the folks in Quebec with Keurig push head office. And I remember being at sustainability and listening on a conversation where the folks in Quebec were like, what about this, what about that? Because here the dialogue is rich. LCA methodologies were born here and have, have influenced Walmart, have influenced the sustainability consortium, have influenced Europe, and have become what is sort of the feedstock of the circular economy. That, that was born here in Montreal and Quebec. There's so much leadership here, it's just amazing. Okay, I think it's time Hit to me. bring in people <laughs> and pick this, yes. this unconventional brain <laughs> here. No, no, I probably didn't use this, but yeah, go for it, anyone want to? Uh, while the microphone's wandering around, I've been at this for about 16 years. There's a lot of different companies in different countries. I've just moved back to Montreal. I'm a Torontonian. I was living in New York for the last 10 years. So whatever was useful to that. Mr. Smith. Hi, Larry. Um, is this one? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, OK, so I'm a fellow Smith. My name is Michael. No relations. And no relation, but uh, my, my work uh, as a consultant, uh, having known Wayne for a while, I really love and thinking of you know, the leadership here in Quebec, would really love to hear your thoughts talking about Danone, Canada. Oh yeah, and they're one big on they, Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, think, I'm using this as an example to talk about obviously a larger food company in uh, Quebec, uh, obviously operating mm -hmm. across Canada, but thinking of that and that as a larger company that has chosen to become certified B Corp, yeah. and is thinking about using its big business as a force for good. So I just offer that as something you might be able to share perspectives on. It's a great example. Um, and I, I don't think any one company is there yet. I still think we're trying to figure out what is there, and maybe we're never there. Like It's like trying to be healthy, right? When are you healthy? Well, hopefully you're relatively healthy now, which you can always be healthier. Um, but I think Danone is a great example, and they are um, coming out in front, and the other uh, food folks are going to be, like you talk to the average, Pretty savvy person about industry, about regenerative ag, the ability to sequester carbon through food, forestry, fiber, and they've never heard of it. And I was like, you know, General Mills is going big on it. You know, Danone is going big on it. <coughs> still haven't heard of it. So we're gonna, we're still a couple growing cycles away, a couple harvests away from people realizing not only is it really climate smart, um, it's way better long term for the farmer. Potentially higher yields. So, so without the carbon a price. example, though, what is regenerative um, yeah. uh, in, in the dairy industry, for example? Well, so ultimately it comes down to your soil. So lots of different commodities and other products interact with the soil. And so we typically think about climate smart practices being reducing fertilizer inputs, um, better tractor optimization. All tractors have GPS now and are often. Um, Group of people. So that's how we've been thinking of it because we had that model. Now we need to reframe and realize that that's actually coming from another way of thinking. Going forward, we need to realign with how nature actually functions. Soil structure is rich. It holds, it pulls carbon down and then it holds it, deepens, deepens, deepens the carbon in the soil. It depends on the growing region, depends on the climate, depends on all kinds of stuff. It isn't as simple as like just do it like that. But the net result of regenerative agriculture, as an example, is that more carbon is held in the soil, fewer, if any, inputs are required in terms of um, fertilizers. Even organic, by the way, there's really but fun... specifically dairy, I mean, is that... Well, so dairy yeah. are, that's cows, water, yeah. right? And right. cows interact with the soil, they eat Obviously. plants, so the net impact on the soil needs to be additional carbon being pulled in. And the, Do we need fewer cows? Maybe not. In some environments, because I mean, as the plant-based eater, I will say in some environments, maybe not more cows, but better cows. So cluster grazing, holistic grazing, holistic management practices that enable the way that animal moves in relation to its food, but, in relation to the wider space. But the whole concept of regenerative agriculture would also mean a balancing of consumption and production and different types of Sure. Produce less beef, less dairy, more plant-based. Yes, but if the plant, so this is the model. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna keep smashing the model to the floor until we go. Wait, there's a lot of shards here. What are we supposed to do with them? More plant-based. I say as a plant-based eater, 
more plant-based doesn't necessarily mean climate smarter. Because if your plants were grown in a way that bashed the soil structure, released all the carbon into the atmosphere, required artificial inputs to amend the soil, nature doesn't amend her soil, right? Nature's like, why are you amending? I was fine. We busted it up, then we had to amend it. That's where the carbon comes from. So if your plants that you ate were grown in a way that destroyed the soil structure, released the carbon into the atmosphere, and created more emissions just to grow them, then your plants are part of the problem. If your plants weren't grown that way, and maybe they were grown in, in interaction with other animals and livestock, just, and look up Living Soils Symposium, which is <laughs> happening in Montreal next week, by the way. Um, is anyone else gonna be there? Go, oh, it's gonna be great. Um, and this is exploring, because Canada is a leader in regenerative ag. So I love that Denona is going there. I think it's a great opportunity. So many, I'm just mumbling now. Hit me with something else you wanna know. Come on, this is your chance. And there was something, there was one other thing I was gonna tell you about. Remind me of the task force well, opportunity. I think you can. I think, okay. Hi, I'm uh, Gary Bell I've worked for Gildan. I've known Lorraine for quite a long time, and I, and I love her Sorry, design. Is it Gildan? Gildan, yeah. Okay, it's Gildan. Um, I guess, I mean, the question is, we've talked about investments, we've mm -hmm. talked about the capital markets. When I look at this whole discussion that's going on, I'm actually thrilled by where we are in terms of evolution of the capital markets not getting involved, mm -hmm. and really forcing businesses like ours to change. Um, how do you think, that role and that interaction is going to evolve. And then I'll throw a curve question at you. Yeah. Which again, you're not looking for any votes in our mind. What role do journalists, in the way that they actually talk about this, have to play in the overall success of this? Yes, such good questions, and I'd love to know Conrad's answer to that too. Um, so I kind of poo pooed the ESG thing, and I should sort of poo poo with more respect, if I may. Um, in the I totally respect the desire for better data so that those investors who are switched on and saying, you know, we want to allocate resources to things that make the world better, we get it, but we need to be able to make those decisions. And so ESG data is simply intended to be a decision-informing mechanism. And I think that's great, except that it has been informing in a overly boxed and therefore distorted way. And there's tons more I can say on that, but I'll just summarize with that. But I think we are evolving in a really exciting way. So in my humble opinion, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD, which was mentioned by a couple speakers earlier, is the ultimate Trojan horse in the, in the best of ways. And again, that's Canadian leadership. With Mark Carney, head of Bank of England, uh, was really a big part of that. Um, I think the Canadian Mafia has their fingerprints all over some of these global initiatives. Why am I excited about that? Because Although it's easy to lump that with the ESG stuff, and that, frankly, a lot of that has been lumped, if you actually read the 10 recommendations that were released last June, and I recommend you do, they're good, um, they are trying to get at four strategic categories around climate in relation to your business. And laced in there and often forgotten is the opportunity side. So for Gildan, for example, where your products are made of cotton, polyester, and other sort of raw materials, you could, in theory, it's not for me to write your report, but you could, in theory, illustrate how, going forward, strategically, you are looking at sourcing product that is actively considering, based on the many solutions that already exist, pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere through agriculture or closing the loop on, on poly-based uh, or petrochemical-based. And then, when you go to your investors, whether they're paying attention to their Bloomberg terminals and their ESG data or not, they're like, wow, these guys have done their strategic thinking on the opportunity side to say, for every t-shirt we sell, for every pair of socks we make, we are part of the climate solution. And I can't wait until people really read those recommendations and go, yeah, yeah, risk, huge, massive, we've got to deal with it. Opportunity. Opportunity feels so much better than risk. I don't know who you guys, but like, doesn't it feel better to feel better? <laughs> you know? So like, let's feel better, and we have the solutions. Journalism. But, but yeah. financial equations, especially. I mean, but they could. The, the risk reward, I know, but. They I could, mean, so where does risk journalism is quanti Risk is quantifiable in theory. Well, but so is opportunity. No, no, I, I so the crazy those. thing is companies have, and I've seen it a million times, companies have money for branding, right? They have money for marketing and old, like really important things, right? And that's opportunity side. Let's get people excited about what we're doing so they do it with us. 
to me, and I, I've been told I have weird goggles, so I don't know, when I look at the world, I'm like, isn't solving for climate through creating financial value really exciting? Isn't that, like, doesn't that make you feel good? For sure, look at the risks. But, but from my perspective, from a, a business journalist watching businesses doing this, they're doing it not because they see a lot of opportunity, mostly yes. because they see a lot of risk and they see a lot, they're, they're scared yeah. about what the liability is in the long term, yeah. about um, not internalizing um, yeah. in, their, in, their, in their calculations and modern methods. So the exciting thing with, regener for example, regenerative ag, and there's other forms of regenerative business, is that if it's done really well, uh, there's a really cool marketplace called Nori. Yes, like the seaweed, nori.com. And they're a new voluntary carbon market. I can tell you more about them if you like. Um, their premise is that if you get it right, and they have tethered one physical ton of carbon to one unit of their currency in their market, is it, a, it is a physical ton of carbon that is unique in the carbon trading schemes out there. If you are able to certify that ton of carbon, it's soil carbon that they're working with, global methodology, then you get to trade that currency. And they've done it carbon pricing neutral. But um, on the journalism thing, I think it's a really important question. And I, I, I'm going to say something maybe controversial, and then you should just fix me, Conrad. My sense is that we collectively, unfortunately, have done a horrible job of paying fairly for quality journalism and paying to think, right? Like we, we incentivize test scores and we incentivize high paying jobs instead of thoughtful students and effective intellectualism in the workplace. You know, the sort of classic don't mess my head up with the facts. And so it seems to me that journalists are either incentivized to just hurry up and get something out there or have to like do great journalism in of the business model. And so it's really tough for you to even do your homework on this stuff. Well, I mean, obviously that's a whole other conference, but I mean, <laughs> the business model is pretty much broken in journalism, yeah. in quality journalism, and um, uh, people, most people don't want to pay for content. We've habituated them to getting content for free or for basically free. and. No one's willing to pay for quality journalism when you can get what you think is okay journalism on your Facebook feed for nothing. Yeah. So um, it's tough to go deep, right? It makes it tough to go deep, but in terms of from a journalist perspective, I don't think I mean uh, personally that um, I don't really particularly believe that journalists should or journalists should have agendas or uh, activists. That it's not our job to say. Mm -hmm. um, that this is what we need to do in terms of the environment and whatnot. I mean, the editorial page can say that. I, as a columnist, can say that. But I mean, uh, I think a good example we've had recently is the vaxxers, anti-vaxxer mm -hmm. debate. That I mean, journalists are on the spot because um, we are, or the industry, or the profession is habituated to balance. I mean, trying to provide balance, but uh, it's no longer considered giving balance if you're giving equal weighting to anti-vaxxers. Um, so there are these are debates we're having. I mean, at, and at what point on an, on this kind of issue do you have to, you know, weigh uh, your yeah. responsibilities? I mean, we have professional responsibilities as well, but it's not we're not arbiters. You know, we're not we, we don't get to choose who has who gets a bigger voice. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, I guess I would say as a maybe a parting thought or something I hope you will consider, and I welcome challenge by the way, I, I maybe sound like I know what I'm doing, but I don't. Um, the, the, the thing I'd love for you to have permission for within your workplaces, and the thing I try to give myself permission for every day, is to imagine that it's more than possible for us to live as a species in collaboration with other species, like we're, you know, our guts are full of other species, the world around us, it's, it's how we function. And so the purpose piece, I think, we talk a lot about systems thinking in business, and there's ways you can look at intervening in a system, you look at the purpose of a system, and then we're hearing about purpose-led business, and doing business like a Canadian, you know, we're purpose-led. There's this pithy way, again, I'm sorry I'm forgetting my source, but if you talk about what's the purpose of a system, the shortest way to describe it is, well, it's what the system does. And so 
I'd like to encourage you to be really honest about what your systems are doing, because that is its current purpose. So full respect to Paul Pullman, he's trying to change the game, and I like what he's trying to do. But to say that Unilever is purpose-led, but then to look at what it does, well, it measures its growth by increased deodorant sales in Asia. That's its purpose. <coughs> is that really biomimetic, right? Is that really aligned with Earth's natural systems? Nowhere close. He knows that too. So what does it really look like to retool that triple bottom line, bring it back out into the marketplace, and say, we know we succeed when we make ourselves better? So to, to sum it up, because we <clears throat> have to move to the yeah, yeah. final. Anna, where would you say we are in terms of consciousness and from where we started 15 years ago or when you started 15 years ago in this to actually making a change? Mm. I think we're waking up. And I love that you use the word consciousness because I think in many ways this is inner work. Like we are the traffic, right? When you're sitting in a traffic. But it day. comes down to the individual ultimately. It does. really does. And it is, I do believe there's an emergent mindset happening all around us. I think there's great beacons of hope and progression and deep thinking here in Quebec and certainly across Canada. So I think, I don't know how long the journey is. I think it's probably infinite. Um, but if we were to say, you know, drop a pin and say this moment 25 years back and 25 years hence, I think we're just about to go up that hockey stick graph of getting it. And that is going to be a really fast, crazy curve. Um, but but I, I believe there's a real awakening. It's a very exciting time. Good. On that hopeful note, we'll conclude this panel and begin the next one. Thank you very much.